Amen. That was uh, that was a great song, a great song to worship and sing to the Lord this morning. Uh, glory to glory, He is He is worthy of all. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the Book of Jonah again. And uh, today we're going to be finishing up Jonah chapter one as we uh, continue in this series called Grace for All: A Journey Through Jonah. And uh, Jonah is one of those uh, books uh, there in the Old Testament, uh, toward the end of the Old Testament, uh, part of the uh, what we call minor uh, prophets. And so I hope you can uh, find that uh, Jonah chapter 1 this morning. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here. We're glad that you're here. If you're uh, joining us live on Facebook or if you're watching this later, listening to it uh, on our website or through some other means, we're glad to have you joining us today for this message as well. Uh, We said last week that um, Jonah is about God's grace, and that's why the series has been titled this way, Grace for All, because this is a book that highlights and brings to the forefront the grace of God, Uh, God's grace, His undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor that He gives to us, and God gives to all of us uh, grace uh, consistently throughout our lives. Uh, We receive so many uh, good things from the Lord that uh, we don't deserve. Uh, like for me, uh, getting to see the Yankees beat the Cleveland Indians in uh, the uh, series uh, last week. Just undeserved, unearned favor for me. You know, what a blessing from God that was. But anyway, I had to throw that in there. Sorry, Jimmy. All right, yeah. Anyway, uh, but, but undeserved, unearned favor, that is God's grace. And, and that's kind of where we left off last week, looking at uh, God's grace uh, in the sending of the storm, not allowing Jonah to get away from him. Remember, uh, God had come to Jonah and God had said, get up, go to Nineveh, and I want you to prophesy against them and call them to repentance. And, and Jonah got up and he went the exact opposite way. He went down to Joppa, he found a ship going to Tarshish, and he decided, I'm going to board that ship and I'm going to go 2,500 miles in the other direction. And he got on the boat and he started to flee from God, and God sent this great storm to the sea. And we said that there will always be a compassionate God unwilling to sit idly by and watch us run from Him or disobey His Word or fail to live out our calling that He has placed on our life. And we said that God didn't send the storm to pay Jonah back for his sin, but to bring him back from his sin. The storm, we said last week, is not about Uh, retribution. It's about restoration. God is trying to restore him. And so today we want to look at the rest of the story with what happens in the storm. And I've titled today's message, Grace for the Storm. And so look in Jonah chapter 1 and we're going to kind of see how, uh, we're going to jump in here and just try to see how Jonah and how these sailors responded to the storm that God sent their way. So look at Jonah chapter 1 and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. And um, and they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. Alright, so they're in the midst of this storm. They've thrown their cargo off the ship. They think they're about to die. They, they, they don't know what to do. And so they decide, we're going to cast lots. And there were different ways that they could have cast lots in that day. Uh, but most commonly, they would have had a bag. Uh, with with rocks in it that would have had certain letters of the Hebrew alphabet on those, and they would have you know kind of shook the bag up and thrown one out, and you got that rock, and that was that was your lot. What did it say? And then you know they would shake it up and they would cast it to the next. And anyway, when they went around, imagine this: they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Not a coincidence. This is God intervening. God used in the Old Testament times the casting of lots like this to communicate special knowledge to people. He doesn't do that um, today, by the way. But, but in that day, God would speak through that kind of a means. Now, so it fell on Jonah. Look in verse 8. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? All right, so, you know, think about this. Um, the lot falls on him. He's the one blamed for this storm. And they want to know, what do you do for a living? And his answer is like, I'm a prophet. 
You know, it's like a pastor when he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing, you know, and somebody comes up and says, hey, what are you doing? He doesn't want to tell, I'm a pastor, you know, right? It's that kind of thing. Here he is, that he's running from God. He's doing the wrong thing. His sin has brought a storm on these people, not just on him, but on these other people. The Phoenicians more than likely would have been the group of people that he was with on the Mediterranean Sea here in this boat. And his sin has brought them into a place where they are about to die. And he is the one guilty of this. The lots communicated that. And so they said, what do you, what do, you do? Where are you from? What's your occupation? Uh, what people are you of? And, and look at verse 9. He said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Um, just to pause for a second, they're not, um, probably not the most accurate thing and truthful thing. He said, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. I'm a Hebrew, I fear him, he made the dry land and the sea. I don't know how much he really feared him, or he wouldn't have been running from him and disobeying him in the way that he was. And if you fear the one who made the sea, uh, you know, probably not a good idea to go get on it in your attempts to run from him, right? But this is where Jonah's at. He's kind of, um, you know, sin does this to us, it kind of causes us to do silly, crazy things. Uh, you know, this would have never happened to Jonah if he would have just stayed at home, but instead, no, he had to run. He was 550 miles away from Nineveh. There was no need for him to go further in the opposite direction, just stay where you are. But no, no, he had to go get on a boat heading out into the middle of the Mediterranean to get stuck in this storm that God would send him. Sin kind of causes us to do dumb, silly things at times, and, and that's where Jonah is. He knows God made the heaven. He's the Lord, the God of heaven. He made the sea. He made the dry land. But he's running from him. All right, now look at verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And so he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Um, even though Jonah knows, like, the answer, he's not quite willing to just, you know, do what needs to be done himself. And I find that a little interesting. If he knows the sea is going to quiet down for them, um, and he knows that all it takes is for him to be cast into the sea, why doesn't he just jump in, right? Why doesn't he jump? just jump in? He's a little bit... You know, still a little bit, you know, of a coward here. He's not quite willing to jump in himself. So he says, y'all, he puts the burden on them. If y'all just throw me overboard, everything will be okay. Nevertheless, verse 13, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. I mean, they didn't really want to throw them overboard. But they couldn't, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. It's kind of a difficult thing to row against God. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, if God created the sea and you're out in a little boat, you're probably not going to be very good at rowing against him, all right? But they didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. Who wants to do that? Let's give it one more shot. Let's get back to the land. But that didn't work. Verse 14, therefore, and again, these are, these are pagan sailors, not worshipers of Yahweh, the one true God. But it says in verse 14, therefore... They called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, this is the true God they're calling out to. Let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. And the Lord appointed another instance here at the end of the chapter, verse 17, God intervening, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Father, I pray that you would just help us this morning as we take just a few minutes to unpack these verses that have been preserved for us in your holy word here in the book of Jonah the story of Jonah, a story that highlights you and, and your grace and your seeking after us even when we run from you. 
Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from it today. I pray you would challenge us. I pray that you would make it, uh, make it practical to our everyday lives. Help us to not view this as a, a, a story that kind of just belongs in Sunday school or uh, you know, on the flannel graph board, uh, but, but help us to view this as a story that has real purpose and meaning and practical implications for every one of us here today. May we listen to you. May we be more obedient because of it. May our lives be more changed and conformed into the image of your dear son, Jesus, through the work of the word and the spirit in our hearts today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So uh, what I want to do this morning is just take two verses here as we wrap up this chapter and, and give us just a few principles. If you're following along, taking notes on the bulletin, you can sort of follow along as we go through this. And so I want to just challenge you with a few things this morning. Again, uh, trying to highlight highlight not just uh, God's grace, but, but also our response and what our response ought to be to his grace. And so I want to kind of show you a few things this morning that I think we learn from this, this scene here in the book of Jonah. First of all, and, and this really takes into account the whole first chapter here. We just didn't have time to get into it last week. But we, we need to beware of the downward, the downward progression pattern of sin. We need to all be aware of, beware of the downward progression pattern of sin. Sin always starts out with small disobedience just little things before it ever turns into complete and total spiritual disaster. Uh, Jonah began by disobeying God's command to go to Nineveh. And he ends up in our scene that we've just read completely and totally suicidal. Uh, Some have have suggested that, you know, that, that when Jonah... Uh, when Jonah asks the men to throw him overboard, that, that you know, he's just surrendering to God now completely. Whatever God wants, that's what, that's what I'll take. But I don't think that's what's going on when Jonah says to the men, throw me overboard. He, in fact, as we read later in the story, after he goes to Nineveh, he's, he tells God, just take my life, take my life. I didn't want to see these people repent. I don't want to do this. Just take my life. And I think even here, when he's in the midst of this storm, and Jonah says, just throw me overboard and you'll be saved, he's really just saying, this is another opportunity for me to avoid having to be obedient to God's calling and mission for me. He is, in fact, saying, I just want to die and drown in the sea. His progression begins with disobeying God's command to go to Nineveh. He decides he's not going to do that. But then it continues as he goes further down in the, pro- in the process. Uh, in fact, this is a major theme in the Hebrew narrative of this text. We see in the story that Jonah goes down multiple times. And that's what sin does. It starts with one step downward, and then another step downward, and another step downward, until we're at complete and total spiritual disaster. There's a progression to Jonah's sin. First, the text tells us, that he left from where he was in Israel and he went down to Joppa. Anytime in the Hebrew narrative when it says a person went down, it is communicating to us that they're moving further away from God, they're doing disobedience to God. So he went down to Joppa, then he goes down into the boat, then he is cast down into the sea, and at the end of our story he goes down into the belly of a great fish. He first resisted God's command, then he refused to repent in the storm, then he wouldn't even pray for the sailors' safety. They came and said, why don't you call out to your God? We saw that back in uh, last week. Um, They came and found him fast asleep, and they said in verse 6, what do you mean? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought to us that we may not perish. And he wouldn't even pray. He wouldn't even pray for their own safety. And then he wants to avoid going to Nineveh, so he has to be thrown overboard to die. Now, listen, I, I think, all right, as I read the story, I really think, you know, Jonah, probably the worst part of his story has to be spending the three days and three nights in the smelly belly of the fish, right? And that'd be pretty gross. How many of you don't even like to eat fish? We got some people that don't even like to eat it, all right? Yeah, I mean, some, some of us don't even like to eat it. Jonah spends three days and three nights living in it. And that's gross, right? That's bad. I'd say 
you're having a bad day, right? I mean, you know, teenagers sometimes say that's the worst. You know, like that's the worst. All right, three days and three nights in the belly, that's pretty bad, right? And that's the bottom of the, the pit for Jonah, all right? I think he could have avoided that. I think Jonah, as I'm reading, now this is just my interpretation. You know, this isn't Bible. It doesn't say that. But I really think had Jonah, when the storm came about, and they came and woke Jonah up and said, call out to your God. I think had Jonah said, God, I know you're coming after me. I know you won't let me get away with this. I should not have run from you. I have done the wrong thing. You called me to Nineveh. I tried to go the opposite way. I think had Jonah confessed and repented of his sin and said to the men, let's go back to Joppa so I can go back to Nineveh. I think had Jonah done that, the storm would have ceased. He wouldn't have had to be thrown overboard the three days and three nights in the fish. None of that would have happened. But Jonah doesn't repent there. That's not enough. It, it takes more. Jonah's repentance doesn't come until he winds up in the belly of the fish. But it all started with just disobedience to his command to go to Nineveh. And then it ends with him completely and totally at the end of his ropes, suicidal, desiring to die. Sin has a drift to it. Sin has a drift to it. Um, you know, someone said it's like this. Uh, sin is a lot like this. You know how, you know how when you're at the beach, um, and you know it's, um, you know it's prior to Shark Week, and so you're not afraid to get out in the water yet, and so you haven't, you know, you haven't been watching that. So you're out in the water, you know, in the ocean, um, taking a little risk. But you, you get out there, and, and, and there's like a current moving north to south or south to north, right? There's that current moving that you don't really feel. And, and you're looking back out at, at, the, at the beach and at the coastline and at all the hotels that are, you know, and you're looking at where you are and your group is, and you're just out there. And, you know, after some time, you know, you look back and you can't find, like, your hotel and your group and your tent and your, you know, chairs. And, and it's like way up there. Because you drifted slowly and slowly and slowly, you drifted, and you didn't even really realize you were doing that. Sin has a drift pattern to it. Uh, it's a little disobedience here, it's a little disobedience there, and then it takes us a lot further than we ever thought it would. Adultery at 40 years old, it doesn't start there. It starts with pornography at 20 years old, right? Right? There is a downward progression pattern of sin. Hatred toward another person. I mean, vitriolic hatred toward someone doesn't begin there. It starts with unchecked resentment and bitterness that you allow to develop in your heart. But walking away from the church at 30 starts with walking away from God's Word at 25. A critical attitude and spirit that spreads negative gossip begins with allowing evil thoughts to sit and simmer and to go unchecked. Lack of intimacy, no connection, no relationship in your marriage at 50 begins with just allowing yourselves to lead separate distracted lives at 30. There is a drift pattern to sin. We all need to be aware of that. And I think this story calls us to be concerned with that and to take check of that in our own lives. Where are we letting sin creep in and beginning to drift? may not look like we're far right now, but you allow that to continue and it'll take us a long way away from where God wants us to be. Number two, we need to allow the storm to bring what's truly important to the surface. We need to allow the storm to bring what's truly important to the surface. You know, there's something about storms in our lives that bring what matters most to the forefront of our minds. All right? Uh, everyone seems to get spiritual in the midst of a storm in their life. And these sailors, Jonah, I don't know, Jonah's kind of, he's not there yet. It comes for him, his repentance comes, all that comes, what's really important comes when he's a little further into the storm in the belly of the, the great fish. But these sailors get real spiritual here. In the midst of this storm, right? They're about to die. Life is falling apart. You know, they're throwing everything. Off. And they get real super spiritual. Uh, they start calling out to God. 
uh, oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Don't lay this innocent blood uh, against us. They, they each call out to their own God as well, trying to see if maybe their God will answer their prayers prior to that. Everyone seems to kind of get super spiritual in the midst of a storm. Um, we've all done this before, and, and we make commitments. In fact, what happens with these men, I think... Uh, kind of a good point to this. Uh, they actually feared the Lord. After, the, after God caused the storm to cease its raging, they feared the Lord exceedingly. They made vows to the Lord, to Yahweh, and, and they offered a sacrifice to Him. Now, it's unlikely that they offered a sacrifice there on the boat. Most likely, this would have been something that they would have done after they got back to Joppa. They would have Jerusalem, and they would have, as, as some have suggested, they would have become... Jewish proselytes. They would have become followers of, of the Jews God, of Yahweh himself. But it kind of begins with the, the storm bringing to the surface what's really important and really, what really matters most. And we've all experienced this, like when life is tough and difficulties come into our lives, we sort of get spiritual. Oh God, you know, like in the midst of the storm, oh God, it, you know, if you will only let this happen... And we make these commitments to God, right? Like, oh God, if you will only, like girls in high school or college, oh God, if you will only let that guy, like they're not, they're not dating anyone and they don't think they're ever going to get married and it's, oh God, if you'll just the storm in their life, if you'll just let that guy look my direction, I'll be a missionary for you, right? Um, this stuff happens, and, and these men, they, these pagan sailors, they commit to following God even in the storm. Or, oh God, if you'll heal me, I, if you'll just heal me of this sickness that I'm going through, I will start giving 10, no, 11%. I will give 11% to you, God, right? And we get kind of, we allow what really matters most to actually come to the surface in the midst of a storm. We need to let that happen. If you're going through some kind of storm in your life right now, if God has, if, if you've been disobedient to Him, if you're running from Him, if you're not following His Word and He sent some kind of storm in your life to try to restore you, let that storm bring to the surface what really matters most. Allow it to bring perspective to your life and to your mind so that you see again, okay, this is what really matters, and you commit yourself to what really matters the most. Uh, <clears throat> no one dying of cancer cares how many profits their company is making. Right? We get so caught up in things that don't matter in life. Sometimes God sends a storm to try to say, hey, you're forgetting what really matters most. If we go through that storm and we never allow what matters most to come to the surface... We haven't allowed the storm that God has sent to do its work in our lives. We haven't allowed His grace to produce what He wants to produce in us. Nobody dying of cancer wants to know how many profits their company is making at the moment. But many care about the souls of themselves, of their relationships with their family members. They care about how people will remember them. Nobody at 75 says... Physically falling apart, says, I wish I'd have played a lot more golf. They do say, I wish I'd spent more time with my wife. I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I wish I'd spent more close friends of mine, which can be done playing golf. I'm not anti-golf. Just saying, they do say, I wish I'd done more to further the gospel of Christ. But see, sometimes we spend so much time doing what doesn't really matter most, and oftentimes God sends a storm into our lives to say, hey, wake up. This is what really matters in life. And if we don't let the storm communicate that to us, we don't receive that. We haven't allowed God's grace to do its work, and we've resisted that. No one says, I wish I had complained more to my husband about how lousy he is. Nobody says that. They say, I wish I'd respected him more. I wish I'd treated him more like the king of the castle. No one says, I wish I had played more video games. Nobody says that. I've never heard anybody say, I really wish I'd played more video games in my life. Now, I played some video games when I was in high school, when I was in college. I have yet to look back on my days in college and say, I wish I had played more video games when I was in college. I have not said that. Nobody says, uh, I wish I'd played more doodle jump. 
Or, ah, if I'd only picked more strawberries in Farmville, or if I'd just gotten a higher score in Candy Crush, all right? But many do say, I wish I had spent more real time with real people. I wish I had read or studied the Word more. I wish I had done more meaningful things with my life. And I think the point that we need to understand from this is that God sends this storm into Jonah's life. He's seeking his own comfort. He's trying to get away from God. He had a pretty comfortable role as a prophet in Israel prior to God saying, I want you to go up to Nineveh, you know, where they skin people alive and bury them in the sand up to their head and pull their tongues out and stake it in the ground. I want you to go, you know, tell them to repent. Well, he had had a pretty prestigious, luxurious, comfortable position as a prophet until that point. God says, no, I want you to do something hard. John says, nah, going the other way. God says, let me send a storm into your life because you need to know what's really important. In the midst of the storm on the boat, Jonah says, still not getting it. I just want to die. God says, life doesn't just consist of what happens with your time on earth. It consists of much more than that. There's an eternity at stake. I'm going to send a great fish to swallow you up and give you one more chance, more grace. And we'll see next week, Jonah finally does. Get it. I'm out of time, so I got two more points I want to. It's a major storm for me right now. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just come before you right now and we just pray that you would help us to recognize your grace that comes to us your grace that comes to us through your word saying wake up sin has a drift pattern to it your grace that says you need to be careful about those little sins in your life because they lead further and further downward your word has through the story of Jonah it challenges us with that this morning you offer us grace to wake up from that. Father, I pray that you would help us to, if we are in the midst of a storm today, due to our disobedience from you, or if we will soon, at some point, face a storm, through these kinds of circumstances. Sometimes I think we, sometimes I think, Father, we neglect to see the spiritual component to the difficulties and to the setbacks and to the frustrations and to the disappointments and to the hurts. And sometimes we fail to see the spiritual component to some of that. I, many times I think you, you, Father, are probably trying to get our attention. You're trying to wake us up. You're trying to remind us of what's truly important in life. You're you're trying to offer us grace to uh, surrender and overcome in the storm. A lot of times I think we we just kind of chalk it up to it's just life. But you're, as we see in this story, you're actively involved in the events of the world and in our own lives. You, You care and you're involved and you're not limited. If you're dealing with us, it doesn't mean you're having to take time away from somebody else. Sometimes we think like our lives aren't that big of a deal, that there's other people more important and bigger than we are, Father, and we sometimes we think, well, that's, that can't be God. He's probably busy with something else, but you're, you're omnipotent. You're all-powerful. You're everywhere present, God. You're, you're not limited in that way. I pray you would call to our attention, Lord, whatever it is you're trying to bring to the surface, Maybe you're trying to help us wake us up and get us to come back from our sin. And maybe you're trying to get us to realize that we're missing what matters most. Help us to receive your grace in the midst of the storm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.